May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the second week of Lent, and it's a great time to wonder about two things, two very basic things about our faith. How does God really relate to the world, and how should we relate back to God? As we look around us, our current political discourse is in such disarray, we may wonder if things are out of control and whether God is relating to the world at all. I'm certain that those people around Jesus who saw him arrested, tortured, shamed, and crucified must have thought the same thing. Where is God in all of this? Even Jesus himself felt abandoned in the final moments of his ordeal. That is why it is a good idea to turn back to the basic tenets of our faith, tenets that were not produced by academies of systematic theologians, but truths that are accessible to each and every one of us if only we have eyes to see and ears to hear. How does God relate to us? And how do we relate to God? I mentioned the word faith, so let's begin this with the second part of that question. First, how are we to relate to God? Over the course of the next four weeks, we will explore this question through the stories of various characters who interact with Jesus. And perhaps we will see ourselves in all, or at least some of these characters. This morning, we are introduced to Nicodemus, who comes to see Jesus at night. Why does he do this? Probably because he does not want to be seen. He doesn't want to be outed as a student of Jesus because of his position within the community. He's a leader, and he's a Pharisee. His ego and his reputation are on the line. We are told that he does believe in Jesus because of the miracles he sees Jesus perform. He's a, I have to see it to believe it kind of guy. He's grounded in concrete reality. Well, that's pretty understandable, isn't it? I can certainly see myself in Nicodemus. The problem arises when one becomes so grounded in reality that one has no vision to see above it, or even inside of reality, inside of ourselves. And so predictably, Nicodemus is not able to understand Jesus' teaching at all. He believes because he sees the signs, but seeing the signs is not enough. The kingdom of God cannot be detected with our eyes. It's rather a reality that can only be perceived through the eyes of the spirit or through the heart. And through the eyes of the spirit, one can literally be born anew or born from above to see things in a new way. Nicodemus takes Jesus' description of rebirth completely literally. How can, we, how can someone re-enter his mother's womb? Well, the answer is that that is an impossibility because it's not a physical reality. It's a spiritual reality. It's a rebirth of our spirit that happens not just one time, but happens continuously over time as we continue to follow Christ. Yet the spiritual relationship has very real and physical consequences, and it all has to do with our faith. You probably recognize that very famous verse, John 3.16, that when you heard it this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, 
but have eternal life. That's actually a verse that football fans are familiar with. It's often like on a placard at football games in the stands, and the camera's pen, somebody shows, holds up the sign. But sadly, of course, it's often misinterpreted. <laughs> the Greek word for believes, uh, pisteo, can also be translated as to trust. So a better translation, in fact, is trust. So everyone who trusts in Christ will have eternal life. It's not really about believing, necessarily. And in fact, the whole emphasis on belief that has has, um, persisted through 2,000 years of the Christian faith is beginning to shift. People realize that it's not so much about what you believe, And certainly as Anglicans, we don't have a a series of of doctrinal statements that we need to (laughs) affirm. But even as we look at the Nicene Creed, we could replace believe, I believe, with trust. What kind of difference would that make? I trust in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even us liberals in Northern California might be able to buy into that. You know, we have a problem. So many people don't want to affirm these beliefs, but really it's not about your thoughts and what you believe. It's much more about how you internalize these messages. So by changing the word believe to the word trust, it becomes about the relationship that we actually have with God. We are to trust God. God gave his son to the world so that we could trust God. And this goes back to the previous verse in John's Gospel, that all who trust God have the power to become the children of God. A more accurate understanding, then, is that we are invited into a relationship with God. And so we are to relate to God by trusting God, that God has our back no matter how bleak things appear in real time. For more examples of how we are to trust God, we can look at this passage this morning from Genesis. Abram and Sarai are invited to trust God in a very radical way. Like so many migrants and refugees in the world today, they are called to leave their countries, to leave their families, to leave the comforts of home and become wanderers in the hope of a new and better future. Indeed, God promises them a new and better future, that they will continue to be blessed in the future despite being away from from their everything that is familiar to them. And they are to be blessed so that they, in turn, can become a blessing. So trusting God means that trusting God means that God will lead us to a better future, that God has a plan for us, and that when we live into that plan through the trust that we have, we will become a blessing to others. We will. If we live the plan that God has for us, we become a blessing to others. In the end, it's not about us at all. It's about our relationships with others, how we can bless other people. Theologian Frederick Buechner described this as finding the place where your deep gladness and the world's hunger meet. It's finding a place for yourself in the world where you just feel right about where you are and what you're doing with your life. God promises to bless us if we trust him, but he does not promise that it will be an easy road. Abram and Sarai must rely on the hospitality of strangers. Famine causes them to spend time in Egypt where Abram passes off his sister Sarai, I mean his wife Sarai, as his sister, just so that they can live. 
How many immigrants, refugees, migrants today are in such desperate conditions that that they might experience such such conditions where they're desperate and they might resort to such de- desperate measures. This is, this is the very first couple that God works through are these desperate refugees, Abram and Sarai, who are relying on the hospitality of strangers. How can we look around in our world today at all the rhetoric that is going on against refugees and strangers and not reflect back on the refugee and the stranger at the very heart of our faith. So John 3.16, God will God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who would use these claims of these promises of God to say that only Christians will be saved, conveniently leave out John 3.17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world would be saved through him. Everyone, everyone. Those fearful of deportation who are living around us, our neighbors in our community today, Those whose rights as transgendered persons are being undermined by the rollback in public schools of the right to use any restroom. Those who follow the God of Israel today, whose lives are being disrupted by bomb threats around the country. Those who revere the God of Muhammad. Women whose work is undervalued because of their gender. God's promises are for all the people of the world. And this is the meaning of John 3.17. So if people want to quote John 3.16 at you, you bring out John 3.17. On this second Sunday of Lent, as we go back to the basics of following Christ, we find answers to the questions, how does God relate to the world, and how do we relate to God? God loves the world and wants to bless us And we are to trust God and to be a blessing to others. Amen.